All right, guys, hopefully my voice is cleared up a little bit today. I was going to cover uh, the, the, the concept of the, the notion of first fruits that is in the Bible, how it directly relates to Christ, how he is the preeminent first fruits, and what all that means uh, as a significance, an insignificance to us as his followers and the ones who are saved by trusting in him as God's first fruits of the harvest. And we'll go over that. So I'm just going to get into it. Hopefully this makes sense. Um, I'm still trying my best to make sure I have a equal mix of, of uh, basic learning ideas. This is not a basic topic, by the way. This is something that's actually kind of deep, um, but but it's imperative because Christ is preeminent. He always has been. He's always been over and above all creation. He's the author of creation, according to uh, John 1. Um, so uh, knowing and understanding this is imperative, and it also explains other symbolisms throughout the Bible, which I'm going to go over here um, in just a few minutes. This video shouldn't be too long, but it is going to be kind of heavy on Scripture, just like most of my videos, and I'll make sure to uh, label off the Scriptures that point to what I'm talking about so you can go verify, just like with all the others, because don't believe me, believe the Word. So here we go. Christ is not only God, John 1, 1 through 2, um, but as the preeminent sinless last Adam, in other words, he is actually human, minus a sin nature as Adam was before the fall, see 1 Corinthians 15, 45, since the incarnation. So John 1, 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. So uh, he's of the father. He's one with the father. Uh, he was the word. And by the way, just to point it out in uh, John, the, the first chapter of John, the, the gospel, when it says, and the word and the word was God, that is no small thing. In the Greek, anytime there is the definite article, the word the, it is very much on purpose because the majority of the time when you're reading through just basic basic writings, the word the is is implied. Um, anytime that it's 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 intentionally put in the writing, it's because it is pointing out that this is the one. In other words, it's it's pointing out that it is very much special and set aside. In other words, in this case, we can call it holy um, because he is the holy son of God. He is called the first fruits in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 24. I'm going to read that. But Christ has indeed been risen from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, fallen asleep in Christ, uh, died in Christ. Uh, that includes all of the believers before uh, his coming and resurrection, by the way. All those who are waiting in what's called Abraham's bosom. I'm sure you've probably read that. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as, all in, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, when he comes, by the way, I want to point this out real quick, when he comes, those who belong to him, this is another proof that the pre-trib rapture, the rapture, by the way, is absolute nonsense, because when he comes is the writer, that is required before those of us who are still alive will get those new bodies, right? So the resurrection does not occur until he comes. Just to point that out, another proof that it's nonsense, preacher of rapture. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power, um, after he's been made uh, ruler and everything has been put under his feet per the psalm. This is a clear reference to the Feast of First Fruits as a clear allegory representation of the then future resurrection of Christ. Uh, this is from the Satanic Rebellion series on ichthus.com. I'm just going to read a little section just because it is so succinct. And I do plan on getting around to the Hebrew calendar. Uh, it's just, it's going to be a big video, big series of videos. And I want to make sure I give it uh, its, its proper due. So let me read from um, the section on first fruits in the Satanic Rebellion series. Um, here we go. First fruits. So Leviticus 23, 9 through 14. I'm not going to read the verse, but that's where you can read it the first time where it's described as the festival that the Israelites were to perform. The feast of the first fruits takes place in the middle of the feast of unleavened bread, and the timing is of critical importance, for it is clearly repre represents the day of the Messiah's resurrection, taking place on the Sunday after the first Passover, just like he rose on that Sunday, guys. Make note. Just as in the case of our Lord's resurrection, it should therefore be not, not be surprising to learn that the symbolism of the Feast of First Fruits appropriately betokens Christ's resurrection. It's talking about it well before it ever occurred. Twice in 1 Corinthians, Paul calls Jesus our first fruits. We just went over one of those verses, actually. Both times in a sense of his priority in the bodily resurrection, which precedes the resurrection of all who believe in him, he is resurrected first above all. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15.20 and also 15.23. Uh, the waving of the barley sheaf, the main symbolic event of the festival, is a clear type of Christ in resurrection. The first fruits of the abundant harvest to come at his return. 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 44. So, 
that that explains it beautifully, wonderfully. I couldn't figure out a way to say it better, so I had to take that from the doctor and give him credit because well done, sir. Um, though initially perhaps confusing to some, the picture is of a harvest of, of of a harvested fruit that requires the death of the plant. So it very very clearly pointed to Christ having to die to be able to be resurrected according to God's plan. In this case, to pay for our sin. The Israelites were predominantly an agricultural people, so the analogy was much easier to see when in the former when in their former position as farmers, agriculturalists, and so on, as this was an everyday reality for them. Alleg the alle this allegory was not lost on them, as well as the clear notion that the entire world is a threshing floor. See Matthew 3.12, Luke 3.17, and especially Isaiah 21.10. Also Revelation 14.5, where the angel says, Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So, again, the picture is, is it, in my opinion, and maybe, I hope yours, crystal clear. Uh, there's more. We also see a very clear, and in my opinion, and also others, description of the 144,000 in Revelation 14, 14, where we see their extreme likeness to Christ regarding women, showing they are indeed virgin young men only, and also from the 12 tribes because it delineates them, and it's the word of God, so it's absolutely true, and we have to accept it, and we can't say any other weird thing like perhaps the JWs where only 144,000 will be in the third heaven, all this nonsense, that's all nonsense, it's all clear. Their honesty and overall blamelessness compared to mankind and even to other believers as well is also their likeness to Christ and that they are killed during the great tribulation during the great tribulation or at the great tribulation's inception uh, and are the first fruits among men to be harvested as a result of antichrist deprivation. Now I'm going to read the verse. These are those who did not defile themselves with women for they remained virgins. They followed the lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as a, as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. Now this comes literally directly after the inception of the Great Tribulation, where the Antichrist basically loses his mind, comes back, attacks Israel, basically attacks the two witnesses. The hundred forty-four thousand are the first he comes after, and it's very clear by this designation that they are the first fruits of the Great Tribulation. Anybody saying otherwise? I'm sorry, guys. You are misled. Um, I can't understand how, because in my opinion, this is clear as day. And anybody reading this, being honest and having gone through all of what the word has to say by looking at these verses, don't see how else you could see it. I'm sorry. So here's my conclusion. Although Christ came some 4,000 years, approximately, after Adam, his being God, sinless, perfect, and therefore worthy to bear our sins, 1 Peter 2.24, Hebrews 1.3, 9.26, 10.14, Isaiah 53.5, and so on. There's a lot more verses. And to be eternal king over all, Hebrews 7.16, Psalm 110.4, he is the preeminent first fruits of God's creation, having done all of this and being resurrected as a proof of who he was and is, and what we who love him have to look forward to, an eternity of blessing in a new heavenly body like his with our God, who will be all in all, 1 Corinthians 15.28, for that a perf perfect eternity to come, and we get to enjoy that with him. I don't know if I could say it any clearer. I don't know if I could make it any clearer. I'm certain that somebody else has better words than I, and I'm trying to be, you know, not too sharp about it because I'm, I don't know if you guys saw in the comments, but we had somebody come up with some some really unrealistic and, and unreasonable and illogical and, and nonsensical, I'm sorry, um, explanations for what this might be. So I hope this clears it up and it makes it quite clear that uh, all of these terms, specifically first fruits and the allegory of, of the world being a giant harvesting floor where... I'm sorry, guys, the plants are killed and or die to harvest the fruit. That is just how it is. In my opinion, it's unmistakable. It also shows exactly how above everything Christ really is. He's not just a man, folks. He is He is, he is the Superman, the God-man, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. The first fruits, the preeminent of God's creation, the first resurrected, our vanguard, as Hebrews also says. Melchizedek, king and priest forever don't think I could say it any better. Thank you guys. I really appreciate you giving me a chance to to show you some things. Um, this is all, both basic and very deep. Uh, it takes a while for it to fully come to the, to the fore. The Old Testament sometimes is very hard to read through and to uh, kind of understand its symbolism because it's, it's parts, it's, 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 it's put to us in both simple and very deep terms all at once. And these things really didn't come ultimately clear until the New Testament was brought about. But that's the reason why the Lord had to come, so we could have the Spirit, and so that we could dig through those words and understand that the Bible is one long, solid, consistent breath, all the Word of God, and all given to us very specifically so that we can figure out awesome facts just like this. 
I hope you guys found this useful. Uh, please let me know in the comments. If I sound crazy, I don't think so. That made complete sense to me, but hopefully it makes sense to you too and it helps you understand that these terms are imperative and, and it is important that we understand the symbolism because the symbolism is both allegorical and also very direct. And uh, it very much always points to our perfect Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, thank you guys. Subscribe, thumbs up, comments, notifications, all that stuff. You know YouTube hates us, but uh, we're just going to keep plugging on. I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do next here and get on to this next video. And you guys have a great rest of your day.